Tripp has ministered in London, India, Trinidad, Tobago, and has been featured as a guest on TBN's telecast of Praise the Lord. He has a heart to equip men to become better fathers and husbands to enrich the family as a whole. As a personal note, I like to say I've heard Tripp speak a couple of times. And when I tell you, even after 24 years of marriage, this man brought a revelation to me that really changed the way that I saw men. And I believe, and I know you're going to be blessed by what he has to say today. Put your hands together for Trip Davis. Thank you, Kim. Good afternoon. Everybody have a good lunch? Me too. Me too. Like Kim said, I've been married for 26 years uh, to my wife, Jennifer. Do you have a picture for me? There she is. <laughs> Tell me that is not a cool mullet that I got rocking there, right? <laughs> yeah, we were married. She was young. She was 18 years old. I was uh, 25. Yes, Rob the Cradle. Amen. <clears throat> and uh, it, it's so hard. Everything that you've heard, young ladies that have not been married, please listen to Kim. Please listen to everyone that you've heard down here. Because if I had listened and paid attention, I could have cut 10 years of struggle off my marriage. 10 years. Because I thought I was the guy. I thought I knew a lot of things just from what I saw. But most of what I saw in my parents' relationship was flawed. Uh, I have a daughter, 26 years old, Nicole, who is here also. And I think there's another. There they are. So that's what Jennifer looks like now. And that's, uh, those are my girls right there. You know, I know some of you are thinking, so director men's ministry, what I've done is for the last 15 years is researched into men, the heart of men. They're actually much more complicated than you think. Not just the simple creatures, oh, give me food, give me drink. You know, it's not, that's not who they, <laughs> see, you're laughing because you've seen that part of them, right? <clears throat> but what I want to do this morning is give you a little insight into a man. So we're going to talk about the boy first. And then in the process of studying men, it's made me a better husband and father. And so I've researched lots and lots about ladies, also specifically my wife and how to reach out to her and how to discover who, who she is, because she's a deep well. All of you are, deep well. And we're gonna talk about that in just a second. So let's look at uh, number one of my list here that I've got is find a man that loves Jesus, a true son of God. A true son of God. The word says that the earnest expectation of creation eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. The earnest expectation of creation eagerly awaits. That's you. That's what I've heard all morning. Waiting, right? Actively living, not passively living, but actively living your life and being who it is that God's called you to do. Answering your calling, doing your thing actively, but eagerly right eagerly waiting for the revealing of the sons of God, the real men, right? The men that know who God the Father is and understand that relationship, and they're not insecure because they know who they are as a son of God. And those men are not tyrants. They're not that guy that just wants to control because they're very secure in who they are. And they understand the heart of Christ, the eyes of Christ, and that's what they search, search out and, and seek. <clears throat> So you don't want a guy that's just in church, a guy that just goes to church. Because look, you can put a boot in the oven, and that'll make it a biscuit. <laughs> just like men in church, just because they're in church, that'll make them a Christian. Yeah. And, and you have to seek it out. You have to find out who they are. You have to research. You have to do, like we say in business, a lot of these men are in business. You have to do your due diligence. You have to do it. You have to fast. You have to pray. You have to seek it out. That's the thing about free will. The thing that God has given us is free will. We get to choose. But in choosing a husband, one of the things you want to do is make the right choice. You're choosing the man, not a man. The man that God has for you. Amen? Let's look at Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But you have to look at this very carefully. And in that guy, this is what you need him to believe, is that he confessed with his mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes that in his heart. So Jesus has to be Lord over every aspect of his life, not just the Sunday aspect or the Wednesday night aspect, but every aspect. Jesus has to be Lord over his finances. If he doesn't believe in tithing, that's a red flag, not a caution flag. That's a red flag. You know the difference, right? Right. Yellow actually doesn't mean speed up and get through the light. What it actually means is slow down because you're about to have to stop. And the Holy Spirit will send us these, right? These flags, yellow flags, caution, caution, watch out. The red flag, stop, 
stop. There's an issue here. There's a problem here. So if Jesus Christ is not Lord over his finances, that's an issue. Tithing is number one. But you know what? Tithing is training wheels. In the world of finance for Christian, for Christians, that's just training wheels. Because offerings come after that and you reap what you sow and God wants to grow a harvest in your life financially, spiritually, and every other way, even in your health. But tithing is just training wheels. It's just the very, very beginning. Lord over his friendships. If he's hanging out with knuckleheads, that's a red flag. Well, but you know, we're trying to bring him to Christ. Well, you've been trying to bring him for Christ for 10 years. At one point, it's not, it's not uh, are you going back for the one of the 99? At one point, it becomes you're casting your pearls before swine, and you need to move on and do what it is that God's called you to do. It's a hard truth. It's a hard truth, but the Bible is full of hard truths. Is he the Lord of a relationship with his parents? That's a tough deal. You ever see a mama's boy? Look, let me tell you something. If you have a guy that is so wrapped up, and <laughs> Mark showed you the, the, the uh, diagram up here a few minutes ago. If he's so wrapped up and still got those apron strings tied to him with his mom, it's a red flag. You're going to have problems because anytime a man puts his mother, father, sister, brother, friends, whatever it is, in front of you as a wife, that's a problem. And it will get worse and worse and worse, and it's going to be misery for you. <clears throat> Lord over his work. You don't want to marry a workaholic, right? Because a workaholic is a man that's insecure and he's trying to prove his value and his worth through what he accomplishes at work. You don't want to live that life. I promise you, you don't. And so this is the type of men that you're looking for. These are the red flags and the things that the Holy Spirit shows you. Be careful. Be careful. You choose. You get to choose, right? And that's the wonderful thing. And it's the hard thing if you do it on your own without the advice and the nurturing and the counsel of the Holy Spirit and wise counsel, right, through Kim and some of the others that have spoke today. Find a fruitful man. That's something, you know, you hear fruit, fruitful. You don't always think of men. Absolutely. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Jesus said what? You will know them by their fruit. And if you don't see a fruitful man, if you don't see fruit coming out of his life, that's a red flag. It's a red flag. How else do you know him? The Lord gave us ni a nine-point checklist. A nine-point checklist. Okay, Lord, so if I'm looking for the spouse, I'm looking for this person, what, what, there's so many different aspects. How about the fruit? Because without even knowing him intimately or spending tons and tons of time with him, you can look at that fruit. Does he have love, joy, and peace in his life? Does he have that? Does he walk in that? Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Is he walking in those things? Watch the way that he deals with people. Watch the way that he speaks to the cashier at the store. Watch the way that he speaks to a waiter or waitress when you're out on a date. Watch the way he treats people. Because let me tell you, that is an insight into who he is. Because the things that happen in public, those things that go, oh, they make you go, where'd that come from? Those are yellow flags or red flags. And you need to be very, very careful. I heard it said before that you can't change him. You cannot change him. You cannot. And those things that you see before, you're thinking, ah, oh, you know, that's not that big a deal. They become more so after you're married. They will become more so. And if you think like lots of young brides do, well, you know, I can, I can, I can do this. All he's got to do is love me and get with me and his whole life will be different. Be careful with that line of thinking. Better yet, show me that anywhere in the Bible, and then we'll roll with that, right? <laughs> show it anywhere in the Bible. So what kind of fruit does he bear? Amen? And then you heard this one also earlier. Be equally yoked. Spiritually equally yoked. If you go to this church, the Baptist church, and he goes to the Pentecostal church, you're going to have issues. Well, I believe in speaking in tongues. Well, I don't believe in speaking in tongues. Well, I, lay, I believe in laying on hands, healing the sick. Well, I don't believe that. Come on. My, my sister started in marriage, and it was only by miracle of God. She was going to the Catholic church. He was a minister at the Baptist church. And they struggled for years, years. And finally, she's like, okay, I give up. I'm with you. You're my husband. Let's go, let's go to the Baptist church, right? Let's hang out over there. And she has different understanding and different belief. But you don't want to start that way. You don't want to do that, right? The, let's see, my Bible says that he created man and woman, and the man left his father and mother, and the two came together and became one. So divisive things like, and 
just judge for yourself. I'm just speaking for me and my experience, right? Uh, we're never going to have one bank account. We're never going to do this. We're not going to go to the same church, blah, 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 right? Be careful. And in your life, you have to judge. Okay, Lord, is this a yellow flag? Is this something that I need to watch out for? Amen? All right, so equally yoked, let's look at 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14. Be alert and on your guard. Look, this is the kind of guy you want. Right. For me, in my definition, we do a camp, a men's camp called the return at Camp Andrizo. And it's for a man to come in and finally come to the realization that he's a strong son of God. Right. That scripture in Romans about the earnest expectation of creation. Right. Eagerly awaits the revealing in our camp. They come to the realization. Whoa, I am this valued, strong warrior. I am what the Bible says I am. And he comes to this understanding. And then when they go back home, the relationship with their wives, with their children, with their parents, co-workers, neighbors, it's completely different because it's actually a paradigm shift. You know what a paradigm shift is? Does everybody understand that? Well, for instance, uh, Stephen Covey uh, wrote a story in his book. Uh, what was the name of it? Um, that. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, right? And he said that this man got on a train, and they're going down the thing, either in Chicago or what have you, and he gets on a train, and he's reading his newspaper. It's like a Sunday morning. And he's reading his paper, and it's quiet, and it's awesome, as quiet as a train can be in Chicago, right? <laughs> but he's, it's nice. There's nobody on the train. And then it comes to a stop, and a man gets on the train, and he has his kids with him. And the kids are running up and down the place and just noisy, and it's just ruined this guy's day, right? He's like, man, it was so nice. It was so cool. And he's looking up at this guy, and this guy's just looking at the ground. And the kids are running, bumping his newspaper, messing around and stuff. And he finally says, hey, what's the deal? And the guy looks up from his paper, and he's like, man, man I'm so sorry. Man, my wife just died at the hospital, and I don't know what to do. And the kids are kind of crazy. And so at that point, he had a new understanding. That's a paradigm shift, where you come to a complete 180 or a new understanding. I like to call it a different side of the diamond, right? You're viewing it. We can all be looking at the same diamond, but you may see red from over there, and I may see purple from over here. Just a paradigm shift is what it is. Amen? And so this is the guy. Be alert and on your guard. Stand firm in your faith. Act like men. Be courageous. Grow in strength. And let everything you do be done in love. Everything. The words act like men, that's andrizo. The Greek word is andrizo, act like men. It's kind of our, our war cry in our camp for these guys, right? I have them yell, andrizo, because I want them to act like men. Be responsible. Be kind and loving. Show fruit. Love your bride. Be responsible. Work. Do what it is you're called to do. And then find out what your calling is in the Lord and go and answer it and do it. Amen? Come on, it's, it, I'm just getting excited talking about this right now, right? But this is your guy, the guy that's alert, always watching you to see what your feelings are. I'm constantly taking the temperature of my home, constantly. And I'm not talking about the thermostat because I am king of the thermostat. <laughs> I'm talking, my wife even got me a shirt, right, for Father's Day. It says thermostat, king of the thermostat. I'm talking about taking the spiritual, mental, and emotional temperature of my home. Watching my wife to see how she's doing today. I'll make her a cup of coffee and I'll take it to her and I'll watch whether she says thank you, whatever it is, not resenting the fact that she didn't say that or whatever because she just woke up, right? But seeing where she is mentally, emotionally. Okay, Lord, what do you want me to do at this moment? How do you want me to serve her? Because literally that's what the word says and that's what it means. Men love your wives like Christ loved the church and even gave his life for it. That word love is agapeo, it's an action word. That means to serve is what it means. It's not sit on the couch and love your wife from a distance. It means literally to serve her is what it means. Some of you guys are looking at me like I'm crazy, right? <laughs> that is what it means. So be alert on your guard. Stand firm in your faith. Not ever backing down from that, from your faith, ever. Standing up all the time. I play Christian music in my business. And if you're gay or Muslim or whatever and you come to my business and you don't like it, too bad. Too bad right? Because I'm a Christian man. I stand up for Jesus Christ, period, no matter what. I'm going to stand for my family and for my faith and for my Lord who died for me on the cross, right? And so you've got to have a strong guy that is not going to get back around the guys that drink beer and go to the bar and cave into that. He's got to know Jesus. He's got to know who he is. And he has to understand who he is in Christ so that he can be strong. He has to experience and know how much God loves him. And once he realizes that, and only then, 
can he love you like you need to be loved? Trust me on this, right? I used to be that guy, right? Be courageous and grow in strength. If he's not studying, growing, if he doesn't love the word of God, that's a problem. When I met my wife, she uh, was just finishing high school and she got pregnant with, with Nicole. It's funny you say about your daughter. <clears throat> Nicole's my daughter, period. Biological, schmiological, whatever, right? People say we look alike all the time. She has a different biological dad, but I'm her spiritual dad. I'm her father, right? I taught her how to walk. I taught her how to talk, and I love her like she's my own. <laughs> okay. He's got to grow. He has to increase his strength. He has to learn how to be a husband. He has to learn how to be a father. Constantly learning and digging. My dad was an alcoholic and a racist. All the words that are offensive to any uh, ethnic group that you can imagine, I heard every one of them a million times. My friends were black, Hispanic, uh, Chinese when I was growing up, and I heard my dad call them every racial slur you can ever imagine. He was an alcoholic. He verbally abused my mom, my sisters, and I had a, a choice that I could be crippled and walk around in that crutch. Well, my dad did this, my dad did that. Or I can take that crutch and break it up and build a ladder and climb up out of that mess and do what God's called me to do, right? You have a choice. Each one of us has a choice. You don't want a man who doesn't want to grow, who doesn't want to increase who he is. Because inside us, even men, there's this thing on the inside of us, we're, and even men, that we're pregnant with expectation. God has planted this seed on the inside of us that we want more, we want to do more. That's the high calling of Jesus Christ, right? That's a spirit of excellence that the Lord has put inside of us. If he does not have it, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be in trouble. So now, let's talk about the girl, Right? We talked about the guy. Let's talk about the girl for a minute. Mm. Proverbs 25, 2. It's the glory of the Lord to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. That's my marriage scripture in, in my life. I told you I'm constantly taking the temperature of my home and trying to find out how she is and how she's doing, if there's anything I can do for her. Look, I, I'm not a slave that runs around my house. It's not what it is. I choose to serve her because I love her. She's my queen. And I choose to take care of her, right? To do everything I can for her, right? Everything. And she does the same with me, right? It, it's a mutual thing. It's the mutual love of Christ in our home is what it is. But the glory of the Lord to conceal a matter, he's concealed much in her. And it's the glory of kings to search it out. So for the rest of my life, I will be searching out that that is on the inside of my wife. Her mind, her emotions, the secret things that God has hidden on the inside of her. And I will continue to search it out and to take that temperature and see what it is because it's cool. Guys love to hunt and fish and golf and sports and all that. And what they're constantly doing is trying to find something, trying to find a golf ball, trying to find a deer, trying to find a fish, trying to find this, right? Or they're trying to get this and get that. And they're searching for stuff, trying to accomplish something constantly. My goal is to try to figure my wife out, right? And she's cool. And we have a great relationship. But sometimes I'll be sitting there watching TV and I'll look over at her. And I don't have a clue what she's thinking. I don't have a clue, right? And she hadn't even said anything. She's playing some game on Facebook, whatever, you know. <laughs> and I look over, and it's like sometimes I don't know her. But that's a good thing. God has purposefully created you to be a deep well. He's created you like that on purpose. And what you want is a man who's going to continually seek that out. And for the rest of his life and your life, continually to get to know you better and better. Because it only gets better. I thought that when I was young, when we were young, you know, in our 20s, and that that, that was the best part of our It's not. I'm 52, she's 40-something, right? <laughs> Five, and, and, and this is the best time. And it's like, if it keeps going like this, it can only, wow. It's so much more than I could ever even imagine, but it comes through digging, right? And comes through researching. And I found out that it comes through the mirror for me. It comes through the mirror, right? Because I can't fix her, but what I can do is I can turn around and look in the mirror. Oh, there's the problem, <laughs> right? A lot of times it's the problem, but I can fix me. So if I'm constantly focusing on me, seriously, make sure and keep this in context, in my relationship with the Lord, well, I don't know if she wants to follow me and do that. I promise you, if it's from the Lord, she'll follow me anywhere. We said when we were young and very, very poor, we had nothing. We had a car that lived in Austin, Texas, and the heater didn't work in it. And Nicole and Jennifer used to go to work with blankets. 
And I was working hard, you know, getting up and waiting outside of work for an hour every day. And we lived in this cockroach apartment, you know, in Austin, in uh, North Austin. And we didn't have much of anything. We kept our money in a little book that was cut out because we didn't have enough money to open a savings account or a checking account. And that was cool. It was good. We struggled through it. She told me she would live in the Kmart parking lot in a tent with me if that's what we needed to do. Even back then when I was a knucklehead, right? <laughs> I didn't know any of this stuff that I'm teaching you, right? But you got to get to know him. He's got to get to know you. He constantly has to be improving himself. You constantly have to be doing the same thing. Constantly, right? Nonstop. Say this with me. I'm a gift. I'm a gift. Say it like you mean it. I'm a gift. I'm a gift. Ecclesiastes 9.9. 9. Live happily with the woman you love through all the meaningless days of your life. Now, see, when, when Solomon wrote this, he was upset, he was depressed, because he figured out that all the concubines and the chorus girls, all the stuff that he had collected and done and tried to do money, all of these things were useless. He said it was like grasping at the wind or trying to hold oil in his hand, is what he said. And so he said, through the meaningless days, God has given you under the sun. The wife God gives you is your reward. So my queen, my wife is my reward. You are a gift. You got to get that inside you and make sure that you understand and realize that you are a gift. Somebody comes up to you and goes, hey, so you think you're all that? You think you're God's gift to man? Say, yeah, as a matter of fact, I am. Because you are. You are. And you have to get this not in an arrogant, conceited way. The difference between arrogance and confidence is arrogance is an external thing. Confidence is an internal thing. And when you walk in confidence, you don't have to be arrogant. You don't have to show everybody. You are walking in confidence with your head up because you know you're a daughter of the most high. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's see. Say this with me. I am a crown. So you know that you're a gift. You're also a crown. This is one of my coolest ones right here that God was showing me. Proverbs 12, four, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who causes shame is like rottenness to her bones. Let's focus on the first part of this, right? An excellent wife is the crown of her husband. And I began to look around, and sometimes when I'm doing research uh, for study, Bible study, or for church, or what have you, I go to Wikipedia just because I'm curious what the world has to say. In this case, they got it right. It was really cool. A crown traditionally represents power, legitimacy, victory, triumph, honor, glory, as well as immortality, righteousness, and resurrection. Whoa. Whoa. That is amazing, is it not? The crown that sits on my head, the crown of my wife, I think of it like this. Power, legitimacy, victory, triumph, honor, glory, immortality. I would not be anywhere near where I am today, not even close, if it wasn't for my crown wife. Now listen to this, it gets even better than that. The Hebrew for crown is atara, and it comes from the word atar which literally means to surround or encircle for the purpose of war, for defense or offense. And when I read that, I was like, oh my gosh. So I found a wife that is a crown who you brought in mm, to encircle me with her love, who helps me fight in offense and defense in this life. Isn't that amazing? Isn't God cool? Isn't that amazing? And, and my wife is exactly that. She is my crown. Her love encircles me, and we fight together. And you've got to get ready, because marriage is going to be a fight. And I'm not talking about just fighting each other. That is inevitably going to happen, right? And you have to learn how to fight right without hurting and calling names. You have to learn how to disagree passionately without hurting each other. We had to learn how to do that without calling names and all those types of things. But it's going to be a fight, and that's one of the cool things, because she's strong. She's one of the strongest women I've ever met in my life. When I'm in the hospital, broke my ankle, had 17 surgeries, two Elizabeth frames on it. And I'm a martial arts instructor. And so I had this horrible, depressing time just in the hospital. And she would go to work in the morning, come sleep with me in her clothes in a chair all night, go back early, four or five in the morning, take a shower and go to work all day, come back and do the same thing the next day, every day every day because she loved me and she's strong. That's the kind of woman that I was looking for. The type of person that you're looking for in a spouse, are you that type of person? You gotta, you gotta think about that, right? Say this with me, I have great value. I have great value. 
Malachi 2, 13 through 15. And this is the second thing that you do. And he's addressing the men, the men of Israel. This is the second thing that you do. You cover the altar with your tears, weeping and crying so that he does not regard your offering anymore. Literally rejected by God. He doesn't consider your offering, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. And yet you say, why? For what reason, Lord? Why are you rejecting me and my offering? What's up with that? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But he did not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit. And why one? He seeks godly offspring. So take heed, watch out, and let no one deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. When I first read this scripture years ago, I'm like, treacherously, treacherously. So that means I'm like hitting her or cursing at her, throwing things at her. Talk. No, what the word literally means is unfaithful. And it's not unfaithful to her. It's that the man has been unfaithful to the Lord that gave him the gift. So God speaks to you and your value in this scripture telling a man that he will be rejected, his offering will be rejected if he treats you in a treacherous, unfaithful manner. Listen to this. Tell me that's not value on your part. Listen to this, 1 Peter 3. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of grace of life that your prayers will not be hindered. Once again, he's speaking to the man and saying, watch out. You need to be careful. Because the thing that I gave you, the crown, the gift that I gave you, that one that has so much value, you need to be very, very careful because you will be rejected in the way that you treat her. And your prayers will be hindered in the way that you speak to her. You got to be careful in the man that you choose. Amen. Let me close with this. So you are a crown. You're a gift and you have great value. And this is ironic what I'm about to say because I wrote this, I was writing this last night and working on this a little bit this morning and it's exactly how you started. It's exactly how you started. <clears throat> and so there's Adam in the garden and the Lord says he's alone, right? We talked about this first thing this morning, right? He's alone and let's, let's like bring him the animals, let him name the animals and all that. And he looks and goes, ah, there's no one that's suitable for him. So let's create for him a mate, a helper, someone that is comparable to him. So he brings his mom, right? He brings his buddies, uncle, neighbors, co-workers, dad. No, he brings him a wife. So when man is in the garden and needed something more than anything else that the Lord recognized, he brought him a wife. Tell me that is not great value. And more than that, when Jesus came and died on the cross, gosh, man, I got goosebumps when you said this this morning. When Jesus came and died on the cross, he's looking around, he's like, I need to convey to them the importance of how much I love them. I need to find an analogy, something on this earth, something, some high type of relationship, some type of relationship that is the most meaningful, the most valued type of relationship on this earth, the most important relationship on this earth so that they can get an inkling and understand how much I love them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick and choose and call them the bride. And I'm going to be the groom. You are a crown. You are a gift, and you have great value. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I want to piggyback on something Tripp said about far as investing into your relationship. You do. This is the first investment. This is an initial investment that you coming out here. Those who, who are married, you're, you're adding to what you already know. Those who are looking to get married, you're getting the information. And those who are engaged to get married, you're just adding on to it. And you do have to continually be investing in your relationship. And with that, I have a list of books. One of your favorite books by Shanti, Shanti Feldman is on there. I know he loves that book. A list of resources that when you leave that you can pull, that you can pick up at the table 
And that's how you get started. You have to go after the information. You just really do. You can bring those chairs up, girls. You have to go after the information. So we're getting ready to do the Q&A. If you haven't gotten your question up here, you can. Um, you still have time to do it. Can I get, uh, Pastor Michael, can you move this down? They're going to bring those up here. Why are they doing that? You still have time mm -hmm. to have a question. If you have one, you can put it in the...